All right. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6 here, there's a very famous section that we're going to be focusing on, and that's the, the last section of this chapter is talking about the, putting on the armor of God. And this is very, very important for us to, to know today, as I was mentioning in the prayer before the sermon, that we are living in the last days. Or, you know, the Bible says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Okay, there's going to be, and things are going to continue to get more and more wicked. It's going to be more and more perilous, more and more dangerous for Christians. There's, there's going to be more, as wickedness abounds, you know, doing righteousness and living according to the Bible has become more and more dangerous for us to do because there's going to be more enemies that are going to try and attack us and to shut us up and to knock us down and to get us, not, get us knocked out of the battle that we're in. And it is, it's a battle. And we, this isn't just rhetoric in the Bible. Okay, we're going we're gonna to go back over these verses. This isn't just rhetoric. We need to be prepared as a soldier gets prepared to go off to war. I mean, think about, think about having a war. Let's just, just, just say, for example, we were to have a war that a foreign army was going to come and invade our land. Now, obviously, you know, if, if troops were marching down the street right now, we could just grab some guns and run out there and just start fighting. How successful do you think we'd be at that, though? If we're not prepared, we don't have any type of defense, we don't have any type of armor, we're not trained, we don't have the right equipment, and we just run out just, just willy-nilly and just start you know, shooting or doing whatever. Not going to be nearly as, as effective as, as doing things right and making sure that we're prepared and prepared for the battle. Here we see all these different pieces of armor. We're going to go through each one individually. You know, from the, the breastplate, the armor, the shield, the helmet, all of these things are necessary when you're going to go out and fight. You don't want to be missing any one of these components. And, and this is being likened unto a real battle. But the Bible explains, look down if you would at, um, we'll start reading in verse number 10 again. Verse number 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This isn't a physical fight. This isn't a flesh and blood type of a fight. It says, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is a serious battle. This is, a, this is a strong opponent that we're facing because we're, we're, we're fighting, it says, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Not just the darkness of this world, but against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Those that are in charge, you know, the devils, people like Satan or other human beings of, that, that, are, that are minions of the devil, that are, that are children of the devil, that are, that are the rulers of the darkness of this world. That, that are the spiritual wickedness in high places, people that are in power. This is who we are fighting against. We are fighting against these principalities. We are fighting against these powers. And they are strong powers, and their power is only going to go stronger and stronger the, the more dark this world gets. The more darkness there is, the more people are turning to the devil, the more people are just disobeying God and living sinful, wicked lives the more powerful the rulers of the darkness of this world are going to become, which is going to make our fight that much harder. We need to make sure that we are prepared because we are soldiers for the cross of Christ. That is who we are today. And this is the message I want to get across. Get this into your head. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but we are soldiers. We need to have this proper mentality that we need to be strong. A, stro a soldier needs to be strengthened. You don't want some weakling out there fighting. We need to be strengthened in the Lord. We need to have the right equipment. We need to have the right, whether it's offensive or defensive. We want to make sure that we are protected against these powers, and we need to make sure that we have the right sword in our hand in order to fight and, and to truly be effective in this battle. So he tells us that, you know, we wrestle against these, not against flesh and blood, but against these principalities, against these powers, spiritual wickedness, high place. And that's why it says in verse 13, wherefore means because of this, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may, be able to, you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. If we're going to make it through this battle, if we're going to be standing at the end, we need to be strengthened and we need to make sure we have the whole armor of God. We need to make sure that we're not lacking in any one area of this, of this whole armor of God of God because if you're lacking in an area that's going to be your weak point 
or multiple weak points, which, I mean, think about someone s suited up and geared up and ready to go into fight and the combat. You know, there's all kinds of different gear that you have. You might have, you know, these days you'd have like a bulletproof vest, right? And, and boots and all kinds of things, a helmet, because you're protecting different areas of your body. If you're, if you're lacking in one of those areas, that's just that much more of a weakness for the enemy to attack you in. But as we said, this isn't flesh and blood. This is spiritual. So everything, all these aspects, all the, the parts of our armor is spiritual. It's, it's something that we're going to need to have in our lives to be prepared and to be ready and to stand against the, in, in this fight. But um, let's, let's start going through this armor one piece at a time. So the first thing that we come to, it says in verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. So the first thing it's talking about is, now when the Bible talks about a girdle, it's basically referring to a belt. So your loins is, is your, you know, this area of your body and your, your loins being girt about. You use it, it's talking about your loins being girded with a girdle. A girdle is basically just a belt. It's what's holding up your pants, right? And that's when you, when you tighten up your, your, um, your belt, you have your loins girded. Without, just walking around without a belt, just, just kind of loose. You know, you can do that when you're, you know, think about like walking around the house in sweatpants or something, real casual, real loose. Not a big deal. You're not ready to fight in that situation. When you're when you're getting prepared for battle, you want your you want your pants you want your pants falling down in the middle of battle. And I looked up um, because there's there's lots of references for all these different um, pieces of our defense of our armor. It's it's not just found in this one chapter. So I went back and was looking up to see if we had gained some more insight and gained some more truth into each of these these aspects of our armor. And you don't have to turn these places. I'll read them for you. But basically, what I found when it, when the Bible talks about like girding up your loins, it's basically just a preparation. You're you're preparing yourself. Oftentimes it's for a long journey, or especially when people are being sent and like running from one place to another. You'll find that they gird up their loins first and then they, then they went out. And um, I'll just read a few of these references for you. In, in 1 Kings 18.46, the Bible says, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. He had a really long distance to travel. It was a long journey and he ran. So the Bible says he girded up his loins. He got, he got his pants ready to go. He got everything tightened up and he went. 2 Kings 4.29 says, Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins and take my staff in thine hand and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again and lay my staff upon the face of the child. If you remember this story um, with Gehazi, he, he goes, um, it was Elisha and Gehazi and this lady had, had set up a place for Elisha to stay in. And, and she did this you know, kindness unto him and gave him food and gave him a place to stay. And he blessed her basically by saying that she was going to have a child. So, you know, God answers that prayer and, and, and God blesses her with a child. And then the child's still pretty young and, and the child ends up dying. He gets sick and he dies. So she comes and, and you know, runs to, to meet Elisha. And when he hears about this, he tells his servant first, this is where we're reading here, you know, gird up your loins, take my staff and go. And he's like, if, if anyone greets you, don't answer him again. Just go, just make sure you get there as fast as you can and lay my staff upon him. And um, it was, it was a, a situation of haste, right? He needed to get there fast and they weren't really close. He had to go pretty far to get there. This lady had, had, had come to him with, with horses and a chariot and, and he ran before them. So he had to gird up his loins in order to do that. 2 Kings 9 is the last place I'll, I'll read for you from. And 2 Kings 9 verse 1 says, And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins and take this box of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest thither, look out there Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. Basically, he tells them that's where he anoints Jehu to be the next king. And that was an important thing that he had to do. He was, again, traveling off to another city. It was a long journey. And he had to gird up his loins. There's other references to this in the Bible. You can look them up for yourself. I'm just getting you to, just to get this idea, to get this concept in our head of why it's saying, well, we need to have our loins gird about. 
when you're when you're getting prepared for something that's long. And one of the things that we could we can take from this is that our spiritual battle is a long journey. It's going to be a long battle. We're going to be in this for the long haul. We might have to go great distances, and in order to do it, we need to have our loins girt about. But it's not just with a with a belt. It says that we um, that our loins may be girt about with truth. That is the the spiritual first piece of the armor that we need to have. And as I mentioned earlier, now, putting on a belt, that helps keep your pants up, right? And this is something you want to make sure that you do when you're going, when you're going on a long run, you're going on a long hike, whatever, because um, for one, your pants are going to offer you protection. You want to make sure that, that they're sitting on you, right? I know when we go off to our, to our combat training class, you know, I, I wear loose clothing somewhat, but I'm always make sure that 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 my my belt, the the waistband is really tight, um, because when you're when you're doing that type of stuff, it's pretty obvious that you want to have your pants up and not down on the floor. And it's, it's funny, but think about that. You know, when your pants fall down, it's a shame. Can you imagine somebody going out to battle? Right? They're they're the soldier. They're all geared up, and they go out to fight, and then their pants fall down. Right? <laughs> That would be embarrassing. That would be a shame. And that's going to um, that's gonna affect you mentally. I mean, that's going to shake you up if something like that were to happen. You don't want that to happen. You want to make sure that your pants aren't going anywhere, that you're not going to be ashamed. And I think that's one of the biggest things we could take away from this is that you know, we need to know the truth from God's word. We're going to get the truth from God's word. We have to know it. We want to make sure that that truth is girt about us, that we know the truth, that we won't be ashamed. Because if we don't know the truth, if we don't know God's word, then we will be ashamed. That is something to be ashamed of. The enemy will be able to put us to shame when we don't know what God's word says, when we don't have the truth for ourselves from our daily Bible reading. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So in order for us not to be ashamed, in order to have our, truth, our, our loins girt about with that truth so that we won't be ashamed, we need to study. We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. In God's eyes, he needs to look down at us and say, yes, that person is studying their Bible. They know the truth and they know how to divide the word of truth. They're not going to be deceived because what's going to be one of the ways that the devil's going to attack? He's going to attack us with false doctrine and try to get us messed up into, into some false doctrine and teaching some heresies and some false doctrines because it's not going to be the truth. And we need to know the truth so that we don't get caught up into these her heretical false teachings. The Bible says in, in Titus 2, verse 7, "...in all things, showing thyself a pattern of, of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned." that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So if we're in good doctrine that has no, no corruption, no corruptness, and, and we take it seriously, and we're sincere about it, and we have sound speech that says that cannot be condemned, then our adversary, our opponent, the, the, the powers that we're fighting against, they'll be the ones that are ashamed since they won't have anything evil to bring against us because our loins are girt about with truth. Because we know God's word, we have proper doctrine, and we won't be ashamed, they'll be ashamed in that day. Let's move on to the next article. The breastplate of righteousness. The Bible says, um, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So a breastplate is obviously something that covers your breast, your, your upper area, your torso area. You think of a piece of armor, because obviously you have a, you're a real sensitive organ up here called your heart that you don't want to have any mortal wounds come to your body. So you're going to be wearing a breastplate that's going to cover your chest, your forepart, from any type of damage. That's physically speaking, right? Now, the Bible says it's a breastplate of righteousness. Now, this is real interesting. I'm going to point this out when we get to the helmet of salvation, but, but the three key elements here of that, that cover us um, from those type of wounds 
are all going to be very related and just keep that in mind as we go through this. So the breastplate is of righteousness. Now, obviously, there's a righteousness of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All throughout the Bible, this is a real common theme, especially in the New Testament, going over that our righteousness, it's not of works of righteousness we have done, but um, it's by faith in Jesus Christ, basically, that makes us righteous. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is imputed unto us. And... Um, it's not our own works that makes us righteous, but that's for our eternal salvation. Uh, the Bible has, has two areas that, that it deals with righteousness. One, being saved. Of course, being saved from our sins, being saved from hell, is only reliant on our faith in Christ. But there is another righteousness that we can have that is that has come from obeying the law and obeying the commandments. Now, that righteousness isn't going to save our soul. But it is a righteousness that we need to have for, you could call it maybe our daily salvation and in a way that we can walk with God where we're not going to be punished, we're not going to be chastised, we're not going to be rebuked from God by disobeying Him and doing that which is evil. We can walk righteously and upright in His eyes. Um, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, it says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So he's equating awaking to righteousness as not sinning. So if we want to have this, this breastplate, this, you know, this, this great armor that's going to cover us from mortal wounds, we're going to need to make sure that we are living a righteous life. One where we're doing the good works. One where we're steering away from sin and getting sin out of our life. When we have sin in our life, think about that. That is a gaping hole in our armor for the enemy to use against us and to attack us. If you have, whatever, I mean, whatever it may be, it's really easy to come up. I don't know why this comes up all the time in, in my preaching, but like, it's just so common with like alcoholism or, or, you know, just people going out and getting drunk. That's a gaping hole in your armor. That is not living righteously when, when you are given too much wine and, and you, um, you participate in that type of stuff. But it doesn't matter what it is. Any sin that you have, the devil's going to be able to use it to turn it against you and to weaken you and to get you to fall instead of to stand and to stand strong and to stand firm. He's going to use any method he can to get you to fall, to get you out of the fight, to get you out of the battle because that will be one less person fighting against him that he's going to have to deal with. So any chink in your armor he's going to go after. And that's that breastplate of righteousness. If you have, if you have a lot of sin in your life, you're going to have a lot of holes in that armor in a lot of places for the enemy to attack. The Bible also says in Titus chapter 2, turn if you would to Romans 10. Titus chapter 2, 12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And I took these two examples about righteousness because these ones aren't talking about just our, our, our e eternal salvation. This is talking about just us living righteously in general by obeying God's commandments. And that's why it says teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. So if you're given to worldly lusts, again, the things that this world likes, the, the lusts thereof, the lusts of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life, all of these things are of the world, and this is sin for us. We shouldn't be given to those types of things. We need to live soberly, right? At no no drugs, no alcohol, living seriously, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The way we live is important to God. It's not just, oh, well, we're under grace, so nothing really matters. No. When you're under grace, amen, that God's not going to hold you liable and cast you into hell for your sins, but He still expects us to live a righteous life in keeping His commandments and obeying Him. We need to make sure that we have that breastplate of righteousness without any, without any um, holes in that armor. Let's look at the next, the next piece of our armor. It says in verse um, 15 of Ephesians 6, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of, pe of peace. So we've covered our... Um, Our loins girt about with the truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Now we're going to talk about our feet covering. We need to have shoes. So when it says that, that our feet are shod, that's where we're wearing shoes, they're shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You're in Romans chapter 10. Look at verse number 13. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember this from our, from our memory passage. 
How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Referring to the same exact thing, our feet. Why is he focused so much on our feet if we're talking about the gospel? I thought we're supposed to bring people into this church and then get them saved here. What does that have to do with our feet? Because that's not how we operate the church. We're not here just to bring in the lost and just do whatever we can and hold all these activities just to bring a bunch of lost people into the church to get them saved. That is what churches have done a huge mistake. By and large, what they've done is try to gear their service towards people to come in and try to get them saved here. Now, if someone comes into our church and they're not saved, amen, we should try to get them saved. We should approach them, give them the gospel. I don't want anybody walking out of this service that, that comes in here without someone from our church approaching them and talking to them about, the, about salvation, making sure that they're saved, and if they're not saved, giving them the gospel. That is what we're going to do here. But that's not what we've been called to do when, it, when the Bible's referring to the gospel of peace and preaching the gospel of peace. It's not referred to as being done in the assembly. It's something that we need to go out and do. That's why in Romans 10 it says, how then shall they call on him? Because it says that for salvation, look, all we got to do is call on the name of the Lord. Right? That's what he's saying. Anybody that calls on the name of the Lord, hey, they're saved. But then he says, well, okay, but how are you going to call on the name of the Lord if you haven't believed on him? You can't call on God. You can't call on him in whom you have not believed. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? We can't put our faith in God if we haven't heard about him. We can't put our faith in Jesus Christ if we don't know anything about him. It's impossible to, uh, to believe something unless you know about it first in order to believe on it. And this is why I stress so much when we go out soul winning, especially with the eternal security. You know, a lot of people claim they believe in Jesus Christ, but if they don't understand the gospel, if they don't know that it truly is a free gift, meaning that, oh, so you mean that if I... Uh, you know, if I put my faith in Christ, but then I go out and commit this sin, that I'm still going to heaven? Yes. They need to have that comprehension and that understanding because the vast majority of people that claim to believe in Christ, they don't know that. Oftentimes, they'll say they've never even heard that before because they still think that you have to live some type of a righteous life. But they can't believe on Christ. They can't believe the gospel if they don't know what it truly is, what it entails. They can't believe on that free gift if they don't even know what it is. That's why we have to explain it to them and expound it unto them. And that's why it says here, they can't believe in him of whom they have not heard. You have to hear about Christ. You have to hear about the gospel. You have to hear about this free gift. You have to hear about eternal life in order to believe in it. And then he says, and how shall they hear without a preacher? So how in the world is anybody going to hear this great news, the great message of salvation without a preacher? So, so far, people are going to say, okay, well, yeah, that's why we bring them to church, right? Because we have a preacher here that's going to preach them salvation. Well, you're, you're still missing one more part. It says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? The preachers are being sent. They're not staying in one place and, and having the lost sent to us. The preacher is being sent. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. They bring glad tidings. When you're sent, you go out and you bring those glad tidings. As it says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Jesus went about all the cities and villages. He didn't stay in one place. He went out. He walked. And think about that. Going to cities and villages. He went about all the cities and villages. Excuse me. He only had a three and a half year ministry. Now, we live in a day of luxury. We live in a day of convenience. We're in Prescott Valley in Arizona, right? If we want to go to Prescott, what is that, 10-minute drive, 15 minutes, something like that, right? We just hop in the car, we drive. Well, what if we were to walk there? That's not going to take you 15 minutes. Now, sure, it's doable. I mean, you could do it in a day. It'd take you a few hours, maybe. But it's not going to take you 15 minutes. See, it's easy for us. We live in a day where it's just, yeah, well, we'll drive here, drive here. We could drive down to Phoenix. It's only going to take a couple hours, right? 
Hour 45 minutes, hour and a half, whatever. Imagine walking. We're going to walk down that mountain, go walk, <laughs> walk all the way down the, into the valley in a Phoenix. Well, they didn't have cars in Jesus' day. And what did they do? They brought the gospel still to all the cities, to all the villages. They walked around and they traveled about. And now, yeah, I mean, you could say, well, they had horses, you know, they had other things, but it's not nearly the same as what we have today with being able to drive in a car. And the Bible emphasizes our feet because we go out to where the people are and we bring them the gospel. And look, this is something, this, you do not want this to be a chink in your armor. We need to have our feet shod with the gospel of preparation. What are you going to be doing that for? Well, for one, we're going to be hopefully getting more people on our side. Right? We've got this battle. It's a battle that we're facing against, against the powers of the spiritual darkness of this world, wickedness in high places. We want to have as many people fighting on our side as possible. And one of the ways that we're going to do that is by going out and getting people saved. Getting people on our side by preaching to them the gospel of peace and bringing glad tidings of good things. The Bible says in the, you know, one of the most famous soul winning verses, Mark 16, 15, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Notice it says, go. It doesn't say bring them here. Go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Don't bring them in. We will never have this philosophy of, well, it's, and you know what it is? It's a lazy man's philosophy. It's, I don't feel like going out and, and dedicating the time and getting my feet tired, and I'm just going to invite everyone else in here because it's a lot easier. We get a lot more people dealt with that way. It's a lot easier when we go out. We can just hand flyers out. Hey, we could even just do mailers, and then we wouldn't even have to go out at all. And we just bring a bunch of people in here, you know, oh, they don't really seem to like the hymns so much, so we'll start changing the music because that will just bring in more lost people and we could preach the gospel to that many more people. Wrong. Church is for the assembly. I'm not going to get into this too much because we're talking about the armor of God. But this is something that drives me nuts with churches these days, that they gear it for, for the lost. And people will even have the audacity to complain like, oh, there's a lost person in service this morning and you didn't preach on salvation. Well, newsflash, church isn't for the lost. It's for the saved. It's for the edifying of the believers, the perfecting of the saints. The saints are people who are already saved. They don't need to hear the gospel over and over again. We need to be giving the gospel over and over again to the lost. And that's why, you know, the preacher, the, the pastor shouldn't be the only one that can preach the gospel. And you have to rely on the pastor to preach a salvation message. Hey, if you see someone in church that hasn't been here before, you know that they're not saved, why don't you go and preach the gospel unto that person instead of relying on the pastor to preach a salvation message unto them? Open up your mouth. Go and do it yourself. And that's what we are commanded to do. We're commanded to go out. Our feet need to be shod. We need to be prepared. This is something that, hey, if this is lacking in your area... Make sure that we get this taken care of. We don't want any aspect of our armor, of our protection, to be, to, to be able to succumb to the, to the attacks of the wicked. We want to make sure every single aspect that we have here, loins girt about with truth. We need to know the truth. Breastplate of righteousness, living a godly life, get, living a life where we're getting the sin out of our life and, and, and walking holy and sanctified in the eyes of the Lord and having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, where we're going out and actually winning souls to Christ. What's the next, the next piece of our armor? It says in verse 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So he says, above all. So far we've read all these different pieces. The most important thing that we need to have, our best defense, is faith. Faith in God. I mean, you think of a shield, and again, we're going to go back to a little bit older form of warfare where people had swords and bows and arrows and all these different things to fight against. That shield that you have is going to deflect all of those attacks against you. That is going to be your primary source of defense. If you've got a shield, you don't want someone coming and hitting you in that breastplate because that's still going to knock you back. It still might hurt a little bit. But, I mean, at least you want to have that breastplate. But if you got that shield, you'll be able to do a lot more with your defense. And that is the best way to be able to, to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Um, or of the wicked, it says here. Sorry, not the devil. 
But um, the devil is wicked. So Above all, taking that shield of faith. Turn, if you would, to, um, to Psalm, Psalm 20. The Bible says in Proverbs 21, verse 31, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. We need to have faith in God. Now again, first of all, your best defense with faith in God is going to come from your salvation, right? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be saved in order to help protect you against the attacks of the devil. But it's more than just that. With all of these that, that deal with our defense, yes, we need to be saved, but we're going to move past that because we are saved. We, also, we need to make sure that we're going to be able to stand and stand firm in our faith and stand firm in our belief by having faith. And faith in God and trusting and relying on the Lord is the best defense that we can have. In Proverbs 21, 31, like I said, it says the horse is prepared against the day of battle. So the, the horse is something that's, that's often referred to in the Bible as something that's like... Um, would be kind of like relying on flesh, relying on these horses, relying on, on the stuff that we've accumulated to ourselves, this great you know, machine or, or um, you know, a war horse, something that, that will give you an advantage in the battle, but it says, but safety is of the Lord. You, know, you can have all these chariots, you can have all these horses, you can have all these things designed to protect you, you can have all the guns that you want in the world. You can have, you know, a hundred guns and, and tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition. You can have all this food saved up. You can build a little fortress for yourself. You can barricade your doors. You can build a moat around your house. You can do all of these different things, right? And you think that you're so safe. You have a security system, dogs, but safety is of the Lord. Amen. If you want to make sure that you are going to be protected, all of that stuff can fail you. Anything can be compromised. Any of that stuff can fail you. Don't rely on those things. Now, I'm not saying those things are, are bad or evil to have. You know, it's not wrong or bad to have guns. I think it's wise. I think it's smart. I think, you know, all these, you know, security systems, and dogs, whatever. These things are wise. They're, they're fine to have. But that's not what you ought to be relying on ultimately for your safety. We need to be relying on God and relying on the Lord, which is going to take our faith. Faith in Him. Faith in the unseen. The Bible says in Proverb or in Psalm, you're in Psalm 20, look down at verse number 5. The Bible says, We will rejoice in thy salvation, and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know, now know I that the Lord saveth His anointed. He will hear Him from His holy heaven with the saving strength of His right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So again, he's referring here to, to some people trust in their chariots and in their horses, but that's not what we're going to rely on. We're going to remember the name of the Lord our God. He is our salvation. Um, obviously, the eternal salvation of faith happens only one time. We need to do that once, but we also need this daily faith in the Lord that he is going to be able to fight our battles for us. He's the one that's going to defeat the enemy. And if you remember, all the famous battles, David and Goliath, all these things where you're going up against these, these um, giants, like David went up against Goliath. He's a giant. He's against all odds. This is a very strong adversary. And we are soldiers in a war and in a battle that is a very strong adversary. The devil's stronger than us. The, the, the powers of the darkness of, the, of this world are very strong enemies. It's something that we can't do on our own. We can't rely on our flesh. No matter how much preparedness we have, no matter how much combat training and guns, and it's not going to help us. We need to have that faith in God. We need God to fight our battles for us, and we need God to be our defense and to be our rock, to be our salvation, to be who we're trusting in, to be our shield for us. We're not talking about a physical shield, but if we're going to be protected from these attacks, because we will face attacks from the devil, we will face attacks from the rulers of the darkness of this world, we need to have our faith continually and unwavering in God, where we're just relying on Him. Hey, we know we're doing right. 
When, when bad things start to happen, we're not going to doubt our faith in God. We're not going to let that shake us and rattle us and get us out of church and, and get us to stop doing good and what's right. We're going to maintain that faith in the Lord. You're in Psalm 20. Flip back just to Psalm 18. Psalm 18, verse number 2. The Bible says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, a buckler is just a shield, and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. This is how we are saved from people. This is, this is how we're going to win. This is how we're going to stay in it, is by trusting in the Lord. He's our rock. He is our main defense. He is who we're going to trust in in order to save us. Turn, if you would, to, or jump down to verse number 30 in the same chapter of Psalm. Verse 30 says, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all that trust in Him. God is our shield. He is our defense. Turn, if you would, to Second Chronicles chapter number 32. Second Chronicles 32. And I'm going to read for you. I, I, I talked about this in this morning sermon, this story of Elisha and Gehazi when they're surrounded. But I'm going to read this story for you so you can see what I was talking about. It, it fit in well with this morning sermon. It also fits in well with this evening sermon. Um, I'll start reading for you from 2 Kings 6.15. You're turning to 2 Chronicles 32. 2 Kings 6.15 says, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So the host, it's basically this big army it comes and surrounds their city. They've got chariots. They've got horses. These are men of war that have come and surrounded the city to come and take Elisha. And Elisha, it's just basically Elisha and his servant. And his servant goes up to him like, what are we going to do? Look at all these people. Verse 16 says, And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Elisha trusted in the Lord. He wasn't worried. He wasn't worried about what's going to happen to him. Yes, the foe is, has this huge army encompassing you. And if he was just trusting in his own strength and in his own might, there's, it's, he's obviously going to fail. There's no way you could go up against such a formidable foe. Such a formidable adversary. But when you have faith in the Lord, hey, the God can protect you. God can be your shield. We need to have maintain that faith. The Bible says that, you know, faith is the evidence of things, is um, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We need to maintain that faith because we can't see it. Just like Elisha's servant wasn't able to see God's protection. In order to have God's protection, we need to have that faith. Without that faith, we're on our own. Elisha had that faith, and he just prayed to God, God, open up his eyes. Let him see. Let him see your shield. Let him see your protection. And he did. He opened it up. The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. He says, we got nothing to worry about. God will keep us safe and God can keep you safe, but you can't see it, which is why we need faith. So when you see these things, when the attacks come, when the, when, the, when the wickedness and the darkness of this world come and attack you and try to get you out of this fight, they're going to look like, how in the world can I deal with this? How can I fight against this? But we don't have to worry about how we're going to do it ourselves if we're relying on God to do it if he's going to get the glory for the victory. Now, we're going to do the things that we can do. We're going to, we're going to you know, prepare ourselves as best as we can. We need to make sure that we know the truth. We're going to make sure that, that we're, we're walking righteously and doing these things. But ultimately, the, the best defense is our faith in the Lord. And don't let that waver. Don't be pushed around by the adversary. Keep your faith. Keep that shield strong. 
You're in 2 Chronicles 32. Look at verse number 7. This is Hezekiah. King Hezekiah is encouraging his men. He's encouraging the troops against this, uh, this, this army that's coming to attack him. He says, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh. He said, all that he has is this strong arm of flesh. The, the chariots, the horses, that's all he has. He says, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. We can rest our uneasiness our, of, of this attack, of this, of this strong enemy. We can rest that God will be doing the fighting for us. God is on our side. Hey, if God be for us, who can be against us? But we need to remember that. Keep that in remembrance day to day in your daily life. This is something that, look, we're getting, we're getting these, these marching orders. Hey, we're understanding about our armor today on Sunday night, but we need to make this applicable in our daily lives. We don't ever want this armor to come off at us because we don't know when the attack might come. We need to make sure that we're prepared for the battle at all times, that we have the armor on us at all times, and we need to be working our hardest in keeping this in mind. Hey, we're soldiers. Hey, I need to make sure that I'm ready. I need to make sure I've got my shield of faith. I need I need to make sure that my feet have shoes on them with the gospel of peace. I need to make sure I've got that, that girdle of, of truth. I need to make sure I've got the breastplate of righteousness. All of these things we need to be making improvements on in our life so that we are well protected and well defended. The devil knows that the shield is our best defense. He knows that. And you think about it, wouldn't that be great? I mean, in, in, in his view, if he get rid of that shield, and that's our best defense that's going to be a lot easier to take us down, which is why he's going to continually try to shake our faith in the Lord. The attacks that you're going to receive are going to be attacks that are going to try to attack your faith. And they could come from all angles. They could come from family. They can come from, from uh, I mean, just from, from extreme wickedness. When, when, when real bad things happen to good people, when, you know, all these things happen to shake people's faith in the Lord. When people die, right? Hey, when someone's life is taken, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they had sin in their life and that's why God killed them. I mean, maybe it was an attack from the devil. We don't know. Whatever, whatever it may be, there's all of these different things, all of these tools, all of these weapons that, that Satan's going to use against us and the, and the spiritual wickedness in high places are going to use against us because they want us to get rid of that shield. They want us to lose that shield. We need to make sure that our faith is strong and that even when the bad things happen, that, that we are trusting in the Lord no matter what and that, and that we're not shaken in that faith. The Bible says in James 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. If we could stay strong in that faith and keep that shield up and just trust in God, we'll have that resistance up. Keep resisting, keep resisting through the trials. The devil's going to flee. He'll go away. You will win. This is a promised victory. If you can resist, if you can hold your faith and stay strong, the devil will flee from you. He will run away. He'll pick someone else to fight. You don't want to be the easy pickings. You don't want to be the weak soldier that's just easy to take out and get him out of the fight. You want to be strong. You want to be strengthened. You want to have your shield up and all of your armor on, right? Let's look at the next piece of, of equipment here, our helmet. The helmet of salvation. The Bible says in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. We're in the sword of the Spirit. Next, the helmet of our salvation. Now, if you notice, the three most defensive articles, because your shoes, that's not really defensive. I mean, that's something that, that you're going to use on your feet to protect your feet when you go out and preach the gospel. The, the girdle, that's going to keep you from being ashamed, but it's still, that's not um, deflecting um, any attacks or anything like that. The three main areas that are providing us the most protection are the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation. Now, notice that they are righteousness, 
faith and salvation, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we gain our righteousness when we're saved. We're righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, how are we saved by? We're saved by our faith and salvation is salvation. All three of the, of the most important aspects that are going to deflect and used against to protect us from the enemy all have to do with our salvation, with faith, and with righteousness. That's the common theme. Trusting the living God is the best armor that we can wear when the attacks come. Having that faith. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That faith, that, that righteousness, that salvation will provide us the best defense and will help us to be able to, to um, receive these attacks and receive these blows, but where they won't be mortal and they won't... Um, oh man, this verse just popped in my mind about... You know, the people of this world, the, 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 the sadness that they have, you know, the grief that they have is, is a sorrow. Um, man, it's, it's just totally escaping me now. It was in my mind for just a second. But um, it, it's a sorrow unto death. Whereas we don't have to have that grief. We have joy because we've overcome the world. And, um, well, I'm going to move on because that's just totally escaping my mind now, that verse. But... Um, the, the, next, the next piece that we're talking about here in the last piece is the sword of the Spirit. This is the, the last element of, our, of the whole armor of God. And obviously an extremely important piece to have. Now, all the other pieces have to do more with our defense and, and um, you know, staying off the attack. Sword is something that you can use for defensive purposes, yes, but also on the offense. This is something that we're going to need to have to properly defend yourself, you're going to need to be able to move forward with an offensive weapon. Hebrews 4.12, real famous passage says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So you think about the sharpest sword, well, the word of God is even sharper than that. It's a more potent, it's a more deadly um, weapon, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word cuts deep. It'll cut through your heart. It'll cut through everything. Not every weapon that you can use is going to be able to necessarily penetrate somebody's body physically, but in this spiritual battle, the power, the strength, the might is going to come from God's word. This is what we need. This is our only weapon, by the way. We don't have any other choices. We don't have our own horses and chariots and our own wit or our own intellect to rely on to fight against the enemy. The only weapon that we have available to us is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God's Word. Now, a lot of people, a lot of Christians these days are walking about defenseless. And I don't mean because they're not carrying a Bible around with them everywhere they go, which that is being defenseless, for one. You don't have that sword. But it's also defenseless if you don't have the, the physical book with you, not having the Word of God in your heart and in your mind. This is why we, we do so, we, I try to emphasize and encourage Bible memorization. Because that is our sword. We need to have that. Yeah, we could have all these other elements. But we just might keep on being attacked. We're going to have any way to fight back and to drive off the enemy with that sword. We're just going to have to keep on taking those attacks. And hey, get all those other elements too. Get, be able to withstand those, those, those attacks. But don't you want to be able to drive the enemy away and use that sword and maybe knock out some of those rulers of the, of the darkness of this world and get them out of the fight so that they're not attacking other people? Well, hey, the only way we're going to be able to do that is with the word of God. The Word of God is powerful. It's sharp. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces through. It goes, cuts right to the heart. That can be a blow that can make a, a mortal wound in the enemy. 
Revelation chapter 1, verse 16 says, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Turn if you go to Revelation 19, we're going to see one more reference to this about the, you know, basically the sword coming out of Jesus' mouth. It's the word of God. This is just a real figurative but, but illustrative way to show us that you know, the sword is it's coming out of his mouth. Um, it gives us this description because it's his words. It's the word of God that, that is the weapon, that is striking and is doing the damage. It's, it's literally the word of God. Revelation 19 verse 11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So who are we talking about here on the white horse? This is Jesus Christ, the Word of God. Jesus Christ came. It says, in right, and in righteousness he doth judge. And look at that, and make war. I thought Jesus was all about peace. No, he's coming to make war. This is at the Battle of Armageddon. This is at the, the, the last battle. Okay, he's coming with his saints to make war. He's on a white horse. He's clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. His name is the word of God. It says in verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in white linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The weapon that Jesus Christ uses to defeat his enemy is that sword that comes out of his mouth. It's the word of God. This is the sword that we need to have. We're in this spiritual battle. We need to make sure that we are well armored. And that is every aspect that we need to have. And the sword's the only thing mentioned that's an offense that could be used as an offensive weapon, weapon that we can go out and do battle with. We better make sure, for one, that we're trusting in a sword and not like a butter knife. These modern versions, the modern perversions of God's word, hey, they're not sharp. They don't pierce through to the soul and to the spirit and to and to the joints and marrows. It's just like cutting with a dull knife. You got the NIV, you know, the New Living Translation, whatever these other words, they're not power, there's no power in it. You know why? Because it's not God's word. It's just the word of man. And if you're going to trust in a false version of the Bible, hey, the enemy's going to laugh at you. They're going to look at you as if, as if you're going to fight with a butter knife instead of actually um, respecting the sword that's in your hand. If you've got this book, if you've got God's word, the enemy will know that and see that and they'll have to take precaution against God's word. And when they come and attack you, hey, if you're well equipped, equipped, you've got the truth. You're walking in righteousness. You're preaching the gospel. You have God's word in your heart. You have your sword ready. You're saved. You got the helmet of salvation. These are all the elements that we need. We've got that shield of faith. You're trusting in God. Hey, you are going to be a formidable adversary against the opponent, against the spiritual darkness in this world. We're going to, you're going to be a soldier that's, that's equipped and ready to go. And you're not going to be soon shaken. But we need to have all of these pieces to come together. We need to keep your sword with you at all times through, through memorization. Make sure you know God's Word. Make sure you know the Bible. Make sure you're not... And they all go hand in hand if you think about it. They're, de they're describing different aspects. But they all stem from the same place. Right? There, there's the, the, the sword is the Word of God. Well, we need to know the Word of God in order to have that truth. They all play together. And we need to know God's Word in order to be able to walk in righteousness. We need to know these things. It's all, it all stems from the Word. And from knowing it, from walking in it, from living it. And, and being able to use it and, and study to rightly divide the word of truth in order to use it properly. Um, <laughs> it's funny, the, the longer, the more I preach, the more sermons I preach, how real simplistic the Christian life is. It all revolves around God's word. And the faith, 
the obedience. It's, it's real simple. We, God gave us, we, we make it difficult. We're the ones that get confused. And, and sometimes I don't understand why. Why do we get so confused? Why is it so difficult for us to just, to just read the book, study it, and obey it? Why is it so hard for us to do? God made it simple. Just like salvation. He made it easy. He did all the hard work. He loves us so much and He wants so bad for us to be saved. He's, I'm doing it all for you. Just put your faith in me. And our Christian life really isn't much different than that. Just continue to, to this is what I said. And His commandments aren't grievous. They're not that hard. We make it hard. Our own lusts and our own flesh and our sinful desires is what makes it hard on us. But what He tells us to do isn't that hard. These simple commandments that He's given us, and, and that's what our life is all about. But we want to make sure that we, you know, He gives us so many different angles, so many different illustrations, so many ways to look at this, and so many reasons why it's so important. All the things we just mentioned, they're not just important to have the armor. There's so many other reasons why it's important to us to be blessed, to not be chastised, for all these other reasons to do the exact same things. But we need to get this through our heads whatever way is going to stick with you. And hopefully this will stick that you say, you know what? I don't want to be knocked out. I don't want to be destroyed. I don't want to be out of this fight and, and not being able to withstand these attacks. I want to make sure that I'm ready. I want to make sure I'm prepared. This is how we do it. We're going to turn to one more place. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah 59, and I'm going to close with this. Isaiah 59, I want you to see this because we're going to see this prophecy of Jesus Christ bringing salvation. It's real interesting, the garments that he's wearing. And, and here, obviously, we saw the whole armor of God. This is the army, armor that we are being exhorted to put on for ourselves as soldiers of Christ, as soldiers in this battle of this warfare to make sure. And you know what? We didn't start this battle. We didn't start this warfare, but we're in it. Whether you want to be in it or not, you're in it. You're saved. You're a child of God. You're in this battle. There's no getting out of it. You want to make sure that you're, you're best prepared for this battle. Isaiah 59, we're going to uh, start reading in verse number 1. Isaiah 59, verse number 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And it goes on and on. We're going to skip over some of this, but basically it's, I wanted to read those first two verses to show that um, you know God's hand isn't short that it can't save or his ear heavy that it can't hear, but it's our own sins that have, that have you know, caused this, this separation, this rift between us and God that have, that have caused us to, to be um, you know, worthy of hell and worthy of damnation, but he can still save us and we're going we're gonna to see this because it goes on and on about how, how our sins are. And if we would just, we ought to have this view of our sins anyways, um, of our transgressions and, and how much we need God and how much we need Him to save us. We'll just jump down to verse number 12. It says, For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey, and the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. So he sees, basically, God sees our condition. And that's what all, like these first 14 um, or 15 verses of Isaiah 59 are just describing our lost condition that, 
you know, we're sinners, we have these transgressions, there's no judgment, there's no justice and equity because we're sinners, because we're transgressing. We're transgressing God's laws, we're transgressing against other people. This is, this is how we are, this is the truth faileth, and God's looking, and there's nobody to, to be an intercessor, to plead for us. There's nobody that can help, which is why Jesus Christ came. Obviously, He's the mediator. He is our intercessor that can bring us back into good grace with God, into good standing with God, because we're sinners. We've already departed. We need Him for the salvation. That's what this, this chapter is talking about. But look at this, because now He's talking about bringing salvation unto us, um, His righteousness. Verse 17 says, For He put on righteousness as a breastplate. Sound familiar? Breastplate of righteousness. And a helmet of salvation upon His head. Again, same thing that we just saw. And He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Now, we notice here a difference. Garments of vengeance. That's not one of our pieces of the armor. Vengeance is not ours. The Bible says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will recompense or I will repay. God is the one that has vengeance. He is the one that's going to deal that blow. He is the one who's responsible for taking revenge on the wrongs that are done. That is not our job. That is not a piece of our armor. So when you're comparing these two, understand, hey, this is what Jesus Christ was clad with. This was what his clothing were. Now, you know, some of the aspects are the same as ours. You know, a breastplate of righteousness, the, the helmet of salvation, but he had the, the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. It says, according to their deeds, according, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands, he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy shall come in like a flood. The spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. This is why we're carrying that shield. He has the garments of vengeance. He can go out and do something about this, but he is our shield. He's the one leading the battle and fighting for us and we're gonna, we want him to be our shield. Faith in Christ as he goes out to battle for us and before us. We want him in between us and the enemy. And that's what that shield of faith is going to do and trusting in him. Hey, he's going to right the wrongs. We don't want to, we don't want to take his place and say, you know what, I'm going to try to right this wrong. Hey, I've been attacked and now I'm going to go out and, and recompense and I'm going to repay and I'm going to get revenge and I'm going to do this against this person that did wrong to me. Well, guess what we're doing? Now we're taking Jesus Christ's place. We are no longer have him as our barrier between, between us and the wicked. And do you think that we're going to be able to stand against that? Because I don't think we are. We don't have the strength to do that. We need to be relying on him as our defense. So, so don't take matters into your own hands. We need to have that faith that God will fight for us. That is our shield. So, um, it, this is an important subject. And it's something I don't, I don't want you to forget about after we leave tonight. This is something that, that I hope you can remember and refresh your mind. Hey, we're in a battle here. We're in a war. You know, this is, this is for real. The, the attacks are going to come. They're not going to be pleasant. This isn't just made up and this isn't just rhetoric. These are real events that are happening. There is spiritual wickedness in high places, in places of power, in places of authority that, that are going to be able to attack us and they're going to attack us. It's going to happen. Prepare yourself. Prepare your hearts. Prepare your minds. Get the whole armor. Dig into God's Word. You cannot spend too much time in this book. Get this in your heart. Don't let it leave you. Don't ever leave, leave yourself unguarded and unprotected. If you have God's word in you, if you have his protection, if you have a shield, you're walking in righteousness, you have nothing to worry about, and then you can cast out all that fear. The fear is not of the Lord anyways. We only need to fear God and keep his commands. We're doing everything we need to be doing. You can walk around bold and not worry about those attacks that are going to come because you're, you're, you're grounded in the faith and you can trust in God that He'll fight that battle for you. It doesn't mean you're not going to experience anything negative or you're not going to get tired, you're not going to get weary, you're not going to get exhausted. But stick with it because you will come through as gold when you're tried. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word and thank you for this great truth. God, help us all to...
to, to take to heart the seriousness, the gravity of, of, of the situation we're in as soldiers. Help us not to be um, ill-prepared for the battle. Help us to, to be strengthened, dear Lord, and to have, and, and to have ultimately that, that strong faith in you, knowing that you can protect us and knowing that you will, you will lead us and fight for us, dear Lord, that we can have that strong shield up before us that will um, quench all the fiery darts of the devil and help us to learn your word, to memorize your word, dear Lord, that, that every time we go about that we'll have the sword with us and, um, and we won't be defenseless and we won't have, uh, and that we will always have a weapon with us, dear Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.